Right. Good morning, class. Um, I'm gonna go ahead with the lecture review for chapter 15. The reason why I did push the test back until Wednesday instead of having it on Monday is because the last week I had canceled labs due to advisory board. And as you know, we split the EKG class into two different classes due to unfortunate circumstances, which Julie had a, a, an emergency she had to attend to. So basically, you're going to stay in my class until the mod ends. But once EKG starts on November 30th, the class will be re-split again between the students who are supposed to go to Miss Julia and the ones who are staying with me. So you'll be getting a new class code and everything else within the next following, within the next couple of days, um, getting ready for EKG. So basically, you'll be starting a whole new uh, subject with her. Uh, you're Lab days for if you're Miss Julia's class is Tuesday, Thursdays, as we discussed earlier. There are two times, 8 15 to um, no, 8 30 to 10 30, and then 2 15 to 4 15 on Tuesdays, Thursdays. If you haven't decided and you are part of Miss Julia's class on what time, there's only one slot left for the 8 30, 10 30 slot, but there's like seven slots left for the later class. So you're pretty much designated. If you want to come to lab, you're pretty much designated to play your class. So unfortunately, because that's the only time slot she has left. Uh, so chapter 15. As you know, chapter 15 talks about blood cultures, uh, arterial, intravenous, and special collection procedures. Because us as phlebotomists, we don't necessarily have to work in phlebotomy per se. Uh, as far as hospitals going to patient's room and drawing blood, you also being trained as a phlebotomist can also work in different types of donor centers. Uh, currently, I do have a few students who are working for Griffles or Telegriff, uh, which is a plasma donor center. Uh, you can also work for a blood donor center like Vitalis in uh, Arlington of the Lake donor center that's in the um, medical office building at Lord. Or, um, What's another one? Um, well, it's Vitalis now. So you can work in a blood donor center as being a phlebotomist because basically you're doing the, basically the same thing. They're just going to train you on how to store the blood and how to interact with patients more because you'll be, you pretty much have to monitor them every time they donate any type, either plasma or blood, because anything can happen within that time frame. They can pass out, they can do anything. Um, our main focus, if you do become a phlebotomist, if you do go into the hospital setting, is um, blood culture. And I know this is a question on today, probably, uh, in the review. When we're doing cup blood cultures, we have to have a 0% contamination rate. If we have a 1% contamination rate, that causes us to be retrained on how to collect blood cultures. Now, normally in class, I would show you how to collect blood cultures, but I don't have the adapters. I had abundance adapters, but now I have no more adapters. So that's why I had to find a YouTube video on how to collect blood cultures, um, because there is a certain adapter you have to use whenever you're collecting blood cultures. And along with that adapter, it has a, um, an attachment to where if you have other labs, you can put that attachment back on to your um, adapter and draw the regular evacuated tubes without having to stick the patient again to collect the evacuated tubes test that they need. So when we're collecting, the reason why we collect blood cultures basically is to say, if a patient has a fever of unknown origin, we wanna make sure uh, we have zero contamination to those blood cultures so they can find out what bacteria, what virus or whatever, what parasite is causing the patient to have a fever. Because if, a, no patient fever, if a patient has a high fever for a long, limited time, it can also cause brain damage because your body cannot exceed the normal body temp. Anybody knows what your normal body temp is supposed to be? Ninety-eight point seven. Yes. 98.7, it is correct. 
your most people's body temp cannot run anything above 97, 98.7. Anything higher than that, that usually classifies you as having a fever. And I know some people's body temp may be a little bit above that or maybe a little bit below that, but that's the norm more body temp than it's supposed to be. So when somebody has out of the ordinary or abnormal body temp, it's and it's due to them to have a fever, we try to find out what is causing the fever because extended body heat or extended fevers can lead to brain damage because your body can't, your brain can't take your body being that hot for an extended period of time. So that's when doctors would order blood cultures. So blood cultures not only can help call, uh, see what is causing a fever, it can also um, deter if somebody is going septic or developing septicemia, which is blood poisoning. Blood poison, once you go into blood poisoning phase, there's really nothing anybody can do as far as how to save you unless they catch it early enough. That's one of those things you have to catch early enough in order to save somebody's life. If it's too late within the process of septicemia, it's pretty much downhill from there because you have your, your body organs are starting to shut down because your blood is too poisoned or it's too acidic and your body can't handle it. Um, you'd be amazed how many people do actually die from septicemia but it isn't as much as it was back in the day because we try to control it or try to adhere it because it's not easy to diagnose when somebody has it. Right. There are also for this test, you need to know how to properly collect blood cultures. In that video, they showed you how to properly collect blood cultures in there. First and foremost, you always have to remember not to have any contaminants because we have to have a 0% contaminant because if we have contaminants, it's hard for them to determine what kind of antibiotic to give the patient because it's contaminated. So they can't find the true bacteria or virus or parasite that's causing the fever because it's contaminated. So it makes it hard to find the right accurate um, antibiotic to get to that patient. When we're collecting blood cultures, we always have to be mindful of the patient because when they're seeing those big old bottles, it scares them. It really does. Because you're walking around with these big old bottles and they think you're gonna drain their whole life away in those blood cultures. And we're not. So we have to make sure we explain to the patient, look, we're not really collecting all this big tube. We just need a little bit in order to see what's causing you to have a fever. So you always have to be mindful on how you go around and talk to the patient when you're collecting blood culture bottles. There are two methods you can use to collect blood cultures. You can use a butterfly needle with an adapter, or you can collect it with a 20 milliliter syringe. And then you would disperse the blood between the blood cultures. We always draw blood cultures as a set because you have to have the anaerobic and the aerobic. Set. And usually the doctors will say blood cultures times two, meaning you need two different sets of blood cultures. Meaning you need an anaerobic, an aerobic, an anaerobic, an aerobic. So it's four bottles, but it's two sets. And each set has to have 10 or well, five in each bottle. So if you have four bottles, that's five, 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 and five. So that's 20 mil syringe. Always, whenever you're collecting blood cultures and say you have other tests, you always have to make sure that you collect your blood, follow your order of draw. Order of draw says you have to collect blood cultures first before you have to collect um, any evacuated tubes. Now, procedure for collecting blood cultures, we always have to make sure that the area that we're drawing from is sterilized. There are two ways we can sterilize. If your patient is not allergic to betadine or iodine, we can clean the area with that. But if they are allergic to iodine or betadine, we have to use what we call a chlorhexaprep. And basically we're scrubbing that site for at least a minute in that draw site that we're drawing. And we basically, you know, when I tell y'all for uh, uh, venipuncture, I tell y'all start at the draw site and work your way out in a circle. 
or when we're cleaning for a blood culture, we're going up and down, back and forth for a whole minute, sterilizing that whole area back and forth constantly for one minute, going back and forth, up and down, back and forth in that area we're going to draw from. So I'm going to share my screen just in case you don't have the notes. Um, if you come to lab today, I will hand out the notes just in case you don't have them. If you, sorry, sorry. If you do have the notes, then um, good. And they are up on Edmodo, so you don't have to. So this is basically what I broke down already, the different methods to obtain a sample for blood culture how to obtain the blood culture procedure, septicemia, having no contamination rate, a 0% contamination rate. So the possible interferences that can go on in collecting for blood cultures is you reverse the order draw. You draw your vacuum taters first, and then you do your blood cultures. Well, you're eliminating the whole cause of blood cultures anyway, because all the bad stuff is now in your evacuated tubes, and what you're putting in the blood cultures is not the full potency of the bacteria or the virus or the parasite that's causing the fever. You have diluted it. Most time, blood cultures are collected, as I said, in sets and within a time interval. Some doctors will say, blood cultures times two per 30 minutes, meaning you draw one set at this particular time and you wait 30 minutes to draw a second set. Or they'll say per 60 minutes. You draw one set now and you wait 60 minutes to draw the other set. So sometimes they'll do it in intervals. Now, if the patient has a pick line or a central line or an art line, the nurse will draw one set from there, see if maybe that's causing the infection and then we do a venal stick on the patient to see if it's within the body itself. So that'll be our two sets. And we don't have to wait the 30 or 60 because we're getting it from two different sites. So we don't have to do that to wait the duration. When we're doing blood cultures, where it's highlighted at, we all not only do we have to put the patient's information, but we have to also put our draw site. Where do we draw it from? Do we draw it from the left AC, the right AC, the right hand, the left hand? Of course, we always have to put our time and date that we draw it so that the med techs can know when we drew it and where did we get it from. On this, on the clinical alerts, I'm going to change this page number because this page number was from the old book, the old edition that we had. The clinical alert I want y'all to read from is on page 483, where it says the clinical alert, those two clinical alerts, where it says for any blood collection procedure, the venal function site must not be recapitated after it has been cleaned for a blood culture. Because once you sterilize it, it's like a, blood culture is like surgery. Once that area is sterile, we cannot retouch it because then we have to start the process all over again, scrubbing for one whole minute all over again. So once we disinfect it, that's it. Can't touch, don't touch, cannot touch. It's done deal. <clears throat> Any questions about blood culture collection before we move on to glucose tolerance? Thumbs up, nay, yay. So glucose tolerance tests. Glucose tolerance tests are given for patients who have an abnormal glucose level when they go in to do their, maybe their annual or semi-annual blood work. This is to rule out the possibilities of a patient having diabetes or not. They might have just had an off day. They might have just ate. They might have chewed some gum when they weren't supposed to chew gum before they get their labs done because you're supposed to get your labs when you're fasting. And remember, fasting means you didn't have anything to eat or drink for 8 to 12 hours, depending on what your doctor says, how long you have to fast for. Or usually they'll say nothing to eat or drink past midnight. So it just depends on what he says. 
So whenever your glucose levels come back at normal, they usually come and order a glucose tolerance test on you, just to eliminate diabetes fear. So usually when a doctor wants to order this, we usually make sure the patient has eaten very at a normal rate for the three days before they come in to be a glucose tolerance test. We also tell them to make sure that they're fat for eight to 12 hours, depending on what the doctor is the day before they come to a test. Now we used to tell them nothing to eat or drink, um, but now we're finding out just before I uh, retired, I guess you could say, from doing blood work, we started telling the patients that they can have water because we were finding out that it was making it very hard to do full cost tolerance tests because they hadn't had anything to drink. Therefore, they're, they would become dehydrated and it would make it very hard to get labs because they were so dehydrated for every hour as long as their glucose tolerance test was. Because it can be anywhere from an hour to three hours, two hours, four hours. It just depends on how long the doctor wants it for. So it makes it hard each time we go to draw that we can't because they're so dehydrated because they can't drink anything once they drink the glucota, which is the substance we give the patients to find out if they have diabetes or not. We try to tell patients not to smoke before or chew any gum. I don't care if it is sugar-free gum. Sugar-free gum has sugar. It's called saccharin. Saccharin is an artificial sweet. It's still what? Sweet. It's still sugar, just artificial sugar. We tell them not to exercise because glucose is an electrolyte. It's part of the electrolyte family. So we tell them not to exercise the day before a glucose tolerance test because it could spike up their glucose levels automatically. So when we do a glucose test, before we can actually give them the glucola, we have to take a fasting lab work. And the reason why we take fasting lab work is to see where their glucose level is at that time. If it's within normal range, we usually give the patient, if they're not pregnant, 75 grams of glucose for them to drink. If they are pregnant, we give them the whole bottle, 100 grams of the glucose for them to drink. If their blood sugar is high before we give them the glucose, we usually have to call the physician to tell them, you know, the patient glucose level is this, do you want to still continue with the test? It's the doctor's discretion to say nay or yay. We can't automatically discharge our patient who's coming into the labs because it's not our blood work. It's doctor's orders. Doctor ordered us to do this glucose tolerance test. So the only one who can neglect it is the doctor themselves. So if, um, the doctor says, no, we're going to reschedule. Then we have to tell the patient, hey, Dr. Ben says you have to reschedule your glucose tolerance test to do your glucose at an abnormal level. Never tell them what it is. You just say it's at an abnormal level because we're not supposed to retest. We can just drop the test. We don't know the diagnosis. And Dr. Ben said to give him a call to set up a new schedule date for labs and to get new orders. So that's how we would do that. If everything is okay, we'll give them the drink and we'll wait till they consume and then draw them for the two hours, three hours or whatever the doctor orders for glucose tolerance test. Now for our post there are two different ways. They can come in and we can draw their fasting lab and then we tell them to go eat and then wait two hours after they eat and come back to the lab and we draw them in. Or we can draw a fasting lab, give them 75 grams of glucose and wait two hours and then draw. All this time, they're not taking, they can't drink any water. The only setback is to taking a glucose tolerance test after we give the patient the glucose. If they become nauseated and they vomit, we have to neglect the test. The test is no involved. They have to come back and retake it. And we explain this to the patient. If you feel nauseous and you feel like you're going to vomit, Please remember that this test is null and void once you do that. So within all cases, try not to. If you feel nauseated, go walk outside. I'll call you when it's time for you to come draw for your next hour lab. That way. So we can do it that way.
Sorry about that, y'all. Um, Postpartum, yeah. So that's pretty much how we do postprandial tests on that. Lactose tests, lactose tolerance test is pretty much ran the same way as a glucose tolerance test. The only difference is it's ran by minutes instead of hours. We'll do it by 5, 10, 30, 60, 90, 120 minutes, depending on how long the doctor wants the lactose tolerance test is. Now, this is something we have to schedule a day before. Uh, or we have to get the orders a day before because usually we have to get the lactate that we have to administer to the patient from the pharmacist and they got to sit there and make it, which is like a dairy mix they have um, that the pharmacist has to um, mix together and give to us so we can give it to the patient. So that's something that's already measured out for us. We don't have to necessarily measure it out like we have to do for the glucola. The pharmacist takes care of it. We just hand it over to the patient and they drink it. The most important thing whenever you're doing a lactose tolerance test is please direct your patient to the bathroom because if they're highly lactose tolerant, as soon as they take that lactate that we give them to run the lactose tolerance test, they're going to the bathroom. And be polite and have Lysol in there too. Just in case. So we always have to make sure we tell them what the bathroom is. So just in case they feel that urge to go. We have to show them what the bathroom is because if they're highly sensitive to lactose, they're going to go. It's going to go. It's going to run straight through them, pretty much. So we have to do administer that lab work. So that's all the tolerance tests we need to know. As far as arterial blood gases, we don't necessarily as phlebotomists do arterial blood gases or ABGs. Those are done by respiratory tests. Now, Opelousas General used to make their phlebotomists do ABGs, but recently, within the last, well, basically before COVID, January, they switched it over. Um, they stopped letting their phlebotomists do ABGs, and now it's strictly done by respiratory or an RN or an LPN or a nurse does them now. Mostly respiratory, especially in the hospital. They are responsible for doing those. In order to conduct a arterial blood test, they have to do what we call the Allen test. It's to make sure that the radial artery has sufficient circulation within it before they do, because it's just easier to collect the ABG from the from the radial um, artery versus the brachial or any other artery because it's not as deep. The radial artery is right on top. So they'll collect it from there. So that's pretty much all you need to know about ABGs other than how to administer the Allen test and how it's done. Um, therapeutic blood monitoring. With this, the reason why I emphasize therapeutic drug monitoring so much is because us as phlebotomists, we do do a lot of therapeutic drug monitoring testing. On here, you'll see a list of the most commonly monitored drugs that we will become familiar with that a lot of patients do take because uh, serolamus, uh, cyclosporine, uh, Prograf, these are anti-rejection medicines for patients who have had transplants, any type of transplant, be it heart, lung, kidney, liver, any transplant, they are given one of these three types of um, anti-rejection medicines, and they always have to come in for labs to get those done. If you also see, I also put what color tube these tests are drawn in. Dilatin, digoxin, and depocaine. Depocaine is an antidepressant medicine for people who are suffering from depression. So um, digoxin is a heart medicine. Hmm? Somebody said something? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Um, and dilatin. So if you see, I put the color tubes. This is something very important because it, remember I did say a while back, um, common labs do have a cheat sheet on the order form. It tells you what color the draw and everything else. Therapeutic drug monitoring will just give you what 
drug you're monitoring, it doesn't necessarily give you the two color you need to draw it in. So that's something you pretty much gotta know offhand. Vancomycin, genomycin, tobamycin, those are different degrees of antibiotics that are given. Those, if you remember in the book, they talked about peaks and troughs. Peaks and troughs have to be drawn on these types of antibodies because they're so strong that they had, and we correlate not only the lab work, but we also have to correlate with that for the pharmacist to make sure that they give the proper dosage of this antibiotic because it's so strong. It can be over strong and not do anything, or it could be super weak and not do anything, and it can do some body damage to the organs of the person's body. Usually if a patient's on this strong of an antibiotic, we have to draw a peak, which it means the different things. Peaks are done after you've administered the therapeutic drug, which makes it at the highest point where the drug is in the body system. And we usually draw a trough before the medicines are given, which is at its lowest peak. So you can see where the patient is at that particular time as far as with this antibiotic. So it is very, and it's highlighted right there, it is very important that you collect these peaks and troughs on time. If for some other reason you're running behind because it's 10, you got a 10 o'clock trough, but all of a sudden they say cold blue in room 256. Well, you're on you're the phlebotomist on the second floor. Guess where you're going to have to go first? Cold blue. If they're calling cold blue, we have to go in cold blue. And we know we have a 10 o'clock trough. So that means that we're going to have to tell the nurse, hey, you're going to have to call, draw your own trough at 10 o'clock because we just got a cold blue in another room and I have to go draw labs. So that's when communication between the phlebotomist and the nurse is very important that we have to, if we can't see, we can't make it to a time test on time that the nurse knows that we're not gonna make it in time and that way they'll be able to draw the patient themselves. Because these are very important. Not only does it go to the doctor, but like I said, it goes to the pharmacist too. So they can adjust the antibiotic levels. Right. Any questions on therapeutic drug monitoring? All right, so <clears throat> other labs we collect, trace metals. Now this is a rare thing we don't do all the time. It's just when somebody, usually down here I did a lot because we had a lot of people who worked in the oil field. We had a lot of welders. We had a, um, sometimes firefighters have to come in and do these heavy metal tests, especially if they um, in a house fire because they breathe out, even though they have their apparatus on and everything else, uh, they still get exposure to heavy metals somewhat in their, when they're breathing in um, those house fires. So sometimes they have to do heavy metal testing. Uh, sometimes we have to do heavy metal testing for patients, uh, for medical people who work in radiology and everything else, just to make sure every, they don't have high levels of a heavy metal. As you know, heavy metal is drawn in a, or trace metals are drawn in a royal blue top. And it can be anything from arsenic, um, cadmium, lead, calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, manganese, mercury, zinc, all those metals are what we call trace metals or heavy metals, as they sometimes call. And then we do these tests it's very important that we collect these tests very accurately because they are very expensive when we have to do heavy metal testing because this is something that's not did in-house. This is something we have to ship off to a bigger lab, like Mayo Lab, to get tested because they're, they're going to another lab because they have a bigger laboratory, a bigger facility to run these tests. So this is a test that takes, it's not a turnaround test that takes the same day to turn around to get the results. This test, this type of test may take a week or a week and a half, up to two weeks, depending on what degree of metal that they're testing for. So it's very important that we collect those. 
Genetic molecular testing is another expensive test. So we have to be mindful of these types of tests. We have to make sure that we collect these in the proper tube and that we, if we don't know to go and call a tech and ask a tech what tube we would have to draw for this particular genetic molecular uh, testing. Uh, some is real easy. You would just have to draw them in a green sodium heparin tube. Sometimes you have to um, grab more than just one. Sometimes you have to pull two or three tubes just to get the um, correct milliliters of serum that they would need to run these tests. It's also important that we have to collect all information so they can run an accurate genetic testing. And we have to get an informed consent form signed before we can do it. Um, some of y'all haven't been at the beginning. When we say an informed consent form, meaning we inform them what the test is, we inform them what we would need to do, and they sign off saying it's okay for you to do this test because it is very expensive. Um, when we do collect the blood from the patients, we not only have to collect the blood sample, but we also have to get their whole demographic, meaning we have to get their family history, any case studies of any diseases within their family history. We have to get the patient's age, where they were born from, their parents' name, their ethnicity, their race, anything that they can give us, we have to fill this out on a genetic assay sheet before we can turn in all the blood so they can do the genetic molecular test. And this is an expensive test because it does go out to a bigger lab like Mayo Lab to be run. We can't run that test in lab because it takes too long to run it. In-house labs only run tests with quick results, meaning turnaround time is within that day. Bigger tests that take longer get shipped out to a bigger lab that can take the time to run a week-long test. <clears throat> Any questions? No, um, keep going. All right, intravenous line collection. This is something we don't do unless we're trained for it. And usually the only person who's trained for it is RNs, NPs, and some doctors will even do it if they're feeling kind and courteous. LPNs, mm, not so much. Um, certain lines they can't draw from, certain lines they can. Most uh, LPNs can't draw from a pig line, or they won't, or they're not allowed to draw from a pig line. But it also depends on that facility of where they're working at, also. So you have, um, you have pig lines, and then you have central lines, and then you have art lines are the different type of intravenous line collections we can pull from. You never ever wanna pull from a straight saline uh, IV because the only purpose of a saline IV is to produce saline for fluids to go in, not for fluids to go out. So anything that's long-term for me, like antibiotics to go in, saline to go in, um, antibiotics, chemotherapy, blood drug, anything dealing with an IV that's mainly responsible for fluids going in, we can't necessarily draw blood for it to come out. So we don't do those. They usually put a pig line or art line or a central line in the patient for them to get access for blood coming out. And only doctors and nurses can draw from those blood, those types of uh, apparatus. So our job as a phlebotomist is just basically to collect per se, collect the sample from the nurse or doctor, whoever drew it. The same thing with cancerless and fishless, we cannot draw from those unless, and this is something new, us being trained as phlebotomists can now work as a dialysis tech. Why? It's because we learn how to skip. They will teach us how to run the dialysis machine itself. We already know how to stick. We just have to know how to work the machine itself. What's the difference between a candlelight and a fishlet is basically what we have to learn and how to stick in those particular devices. 
Now, a cantilever is just a tubular instrument that's attached for um, dialysis. It's a tubular, usually it's attached somewhere within the growing area of the patient. Some of them, some it might be attached in the arm, but usually that's fistulas. And fistulas are the fusion of a vein and an artery together. Um, and usually if a physician does it right, you really sometimes can't even tell a patient does have a fistula. Sometimes fistulas can be gnarly and kind of, you know, distorted because it is the fusing of a vein and an artery together. And if you're not sure if the patient has a fistula or not, if you put your hand on top of it lightly, you can actually feel it hum. And when I say hum, it's because the artery is pumping through it so much or so fast, it'll actually use like a slight vibration, it'll actually hum, or it almost feels like a mechanical instrument or a mechanical engine running in that patient's arm because it's just pumping out that fast. Um, one thing to always remember, if you do run into a patient who has a fistula or a, a fistula, we cannot draw in that arm. That arm is specifically used for dialysis only. We cannot put a tourniquet on it. We can't put a blood pressure cuff on it. We can't do nothing with that arm. It is strictly dialysis arm only because it is the fusing of a vein and an artery together. So sometimes it leaves, like I said, it leaves these big gnarly veins. They puff up really fast, really big. And if we apply pressure to it, we can pop it. And that's somebody's life on the line because usually if they're going through dialysis, that means they're going through severe kidney failure, renal failure or kidney failure. And so they, that's their lifeline because if your kidney is not flushing out all the bad stuff, it can turn your blood to septic because that's basically what dialysis does. It stops your body from, your blood from going septic because your kidney is not doing what it's supposed to do and flush out all the bad stuff. So you have to go through a dialysis and basically clean out your blood of all the toxins and then they re clean it and redistribute it back to your body as clean blood. That's why most people, depending on how severe their renal failure is, either has to go every other day or almost every day. Just depends. Any questions? So as far as blood donor collection, sorry, it's not doing what I want it to do. Whenever you donate blood, the first thing they're going to ask you is a whole bunch of series of questions. And when you're donating blood, they're going to make sure that you're over the legal age and it's anything. Now, usually, you know, normally legal age is 18 or older for blood donations is 17 or older without parents' consent. So uh, you can donate blood. They'll also now ask you, have you been out of the country within the past six months or past year? If you answer no to all these answers or yes to whatever, they're also going to ask you what type of medication you take because certain medications won't allow you to do blood donations because of what it does for you. Um, and you have to be a specific weight in order to donate blood. You have to be 100 pounds, over 100 pounds in order to donate blood. Uh, you can't be a former drug user. If you did hyper, like, injection drugs, you cannot donate blood at all. You're worked out completely. Even if you have been through rehab, your system's clean, they still say no. Because sometimes they think psychologically that can trigger you to go back into using drugs again. That's just the way it is. So if you say yes, no to all the questions they ask you, they're going to do a physical on you. And when they do a physical, they're checking your weight, your temperature, your pulse, your blood pressure. And they're also checking your H and H or your hemocrats and hemoglobins to make sure that your iron level is where it needs to be. Your hemoglobin has to be a 12.5 or higher before they can give you or let you do a blood donation. If it's not, they're not going to let you do one because your iron level is already, your hemoglobins are already at a dangerous low level, meaning your body doesn't have enough iron to sustain the loss of blood because it can't replenish it fast enough to 
give it back once they take it out. All right, any questions? The whole purpose of donor blood donation is to basically divide it out into different ABO groupings or blood classifications or blood types. Everybody is either A, B, or A, B, or O, plus and minus, plus or minus A, B, A, B, and O. Who knows who is the universal recipient of blood? Anybody knows the universal recipient? A, B. A, B, yes. Who is the universal donor? Oh, oh yeah. God, I know I just sent y'all a video on that <laughs> about blood donation. Yes, A, B is the universal recipient. They can receive anybody's blood, meaning A, B, A, B itself, O. O is the universal donor because it can give to everybody else, but people who have O can only get O positive or O negative. They can't get any other blood from nobody else. That's why it's highly, that's why whenever they do blood donations, they want O blood so badly because they know if somebody comes into the emergency room due to blood loss and they need to give them a blood transfusion, O blood is the hardest thing to find because not every, first of all, not everybody is O and it's very rare because we can give to everybody O type blood people can give to everybody else. So when we need it, there's hardly anything left because we done gave it to everybody else. So that's why most of the time when you go to a donor center, they get excited on, you get an extra treat if you say you're O. <laughs> you're O blood, I'm O. And I happen to be O, so I can't get nobody else's blood but my own. Um, so basically another thing about this also, not only Giving blood is a good thing because sometimes they can break down the components into just red blood cells or just for platelets. And usually the platelet levels are used for cancer patients. And then you have plasma. Plasma, they're finding out, can cure a lot of diseases. That's why um, telecrisis or drupals, as they say, come is around now and does a lot of plasma donations um, or a plasma center because plasma can cure a lot of things you know, childhood diseases and stuff they're finding out. So their call for plasma is very in high demand nowadays versus back in the day. Audiologic, audiologic transfusion. These are people who, I call them hypochondriacs. No, these are people who donate their own blood for themselves in case of surgery, in case of blood loss, during surgery. So basically, instead of getting donated blood from a stranger and possibly contracting anything, even though this blood gets screened, they get screened for hepatitis, they get screened for AIDS, they get screened, it gets screened for every known blood transferable disease possible, it gets screened for out in the donor center. Once the blood has been pumped out, it gets screened. But for those who still feel weary, even though they do screen, all the donated blood now for any known blood transferable diseases, you can donate your own blood prior to surgery. So if you do suffer a blood loss while you're in surgery, you'll be transfused your own blood back into your body. That's what audiologic transfusion means. It means you donate, you're donating your blood to, in order to infuse, transfuse back into you if you suffer blood loss during surgery. That's basically that. Therapeutic phlebotomy. Now, blood donor centers used to do these. I know within the past two years, yeah, within the past two years, phlebotomists have been responsible for therapeutic phlebotomy, especially at Lafayette General. Um, not so much at Lourdes, I don't think. I think 
the blood donor center still does the therapeutic phlebotomy. And basically what therapeutic phlebotomy is, if somebody has, you're supposed to have a number, a certain number of red blood cells within your body at all times. But some people develop too many red blood cells and it can be harmful more than helpful for that person. So they have to go through therapeutic phlebotomy in order to decrease the number of red blood cells within their body. But before we can do therapeutic phlebotomy, we always have to do what we call an H and H, a hemoglobin hemocrat, to see what what is their level of in order to receive um, to do a therapeutic phlebotomy. So um, if the numbers are excessive. Basically, what they do is prep them like they're doing a blood donation, and they have doctor's orders. The doctor's orders are described if the red blood cells are exceeding this amount of money, you're going to draw out or donate out this amount of milliliters of blood from this patient. So each doctor orders tells you what level of blood you have to extract from that patient through the doctor's orders. It's not, just a, it's not always a whole pint. Of blood like we do when we do a blood donation. It's certain degrees of it depending on how excessive their red blood cells are is how they would do it. Right. And that concludes chapter 15. Anybody has any questions about chapter 15? Now is the time to ask because the test is tomorrow. Anybody? Nobody? Somebody? All right. So today you should have had this Zoom review. Oh, I'm going to stop this. You should have had the Zoom review today. Oh, somebody's asking questions. Sorry, if I have it on share screen, I can't um, see the um, when y'all text in. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, Uh, somebody asked me about uh, alcohol prep on blood cultures. The only time you'll use an alcohol prep is to clean the blood culture tops. That is the only time you use a, a alcohol prep. But as far as cleaning the site itself, no, we do not use alcohol. Alcohol is considered a cat contaminant because it has alcohol in it. It has alcohol. And alcohol does what? Kill germs. So we don't want to kill the germs. We just need to disinfect the area. So iodine or betadine or chlorhexaprep will decontaminate or sterilize that area. But alcohol is just basically to clean the tops of the blood culture bottles itself. That's the only time we use blood cultures. I mean, the alcohol preps. I'm sorry. Any other questions? And sorry if I didn't see your question earlier when you had sent it about um, blood cultures. But like I said, when I'm sharing a screen, I can't see the chat log. Okay. Anybody else? All right, if there's no other questions, um, this, if for those who didn't get the beginning part of this lecture, it will be on, um, I will post it up to Zoom as soon as it converts. I will post it up to Edmodo as soon as it converts the um, lecture, this review lecture. If you see or rewatch the lecture and you see I'm talking through it and you come up with a different question, just text it to me or message to me and I'll answer the question or anything. Other than that, good luck on your test tomorrow.
and we're going to be rocking and rolling with chapter 16 come Thursday. I'll talk to y'all later, and y'all have a nice rest of the day. Bye.